Al Kazmi from Sharjah Art Foundation. Uh, we welcome Sabi Ahmad from Ishara Foundation, and very sadly, Don Ross, uh, due to visa problems, was unable to come. So we are going to fill in for her. And Inakshi, thank you for moderating this morning. And uh, I wanted to also give a big thank you to our supporters, the India Art Fair. It's a very natural, um, uh, you know, collaboration. And uh, thank you for, you know, the support that you've not given just this year, but over the years. And uh, we really, we, you know, I think the galleries and India Art Fair are, are you know, natural partners. So thank you for your support always. And um, yeah, I think we can go ahead and um, and actually you can begin. Thank you. Also, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Shireen and the Mumbai Gallery Weekend for bringing us all together on this very beautiful morning. Um, I uh, um, at this really lovely venue with all this beautiful foliage surrounding us. Um, I'm also very excited to welcome our special guests, um, very accomplished um, 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 uh, guests from the UAE uh, who are joining us today, Navar al Kasimi, Vice President from the Sharjah Arts Foundation, and Sabi Ahmed, uh, Curator and Associate Director of uh, the Ishara Arts Foundation. Really sorry that uh, Don Ross, uh, head of collections at the Jamil Art Center, couldn't join us today uh, because of um, a challenge uh, with her visa. We really do need to re-engineer our visa processes across the world. Don has very kindly sent a little note in, um, sharing a little bit about uh, the Jamil Art Center, which um, I'm going to request Sabi to, to, to read out uh, in the context of this uh, conversation. Um, it's really thrilling to see the cultural renaissance that's exploding in the Middle East. Um, and um, I, like all of you, I'm very keen to seek uh, Navar and Sabi's perspectives on this. And in that context, um, map the three incredible contemporary art institutions that they um, lead in the region. But before I begin, I want to say a little bit uh, or, or, or sh speak a little bit about why I refer to this as a cultural renaissance. And um, um, increasingly, I'm seeing countries in the GC GCC um, um, wanting to become tourism hubs, pegged and leveraging um, art and culture. And uh, this is a, a slight shift from the past where uh, culture was probably um, uh, acknowledged at a national level, but its full economic potential wasn't. Um, and I think this shift is interesting because it's, uh, this, this, this surge in the creative economy has uh, generated huge employment opportunities, is, um, um, has created, is creating new economic activities, new forms of um, community engagement, and I'd love to uh, talk to both of you about this uh, in the course of the conversation. Um, as, as a little context, uh, Saudi Arabia over the last few years has invested over a hundred billion dollars um, in, uh, in the creative economy, uh, setting up the, the Rear Gates project, which encompasses um, um, uh, an art district, art academies, uh, a, a, a media art institute, museums, um, last year, the Islamic Arts uh, Biennale was organized by the Diria Biennale Foundation. Uh, I had the pleasure of spending some time with Sumaya Wali, who was one of the curators of the Islamic Arts Biennale in Lunuganga last year. Um, equally, huge, huge investments uh, in the creative economy being unveiled in Abu Dhabi with the creation of uh, four incredible museums, the Guggenheim uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, the um, uh, the Natural History Museum, the uh, Team Labs Phenomena, uh, Abu Dhabi, and the Zayed National Museum. Um, I'm given to understand that Dubai was ranked regionally uh, number one and uh, globally number two in attracting foreign direct investment in the creative economy. In uh, 2021, over $2 billion uh, was uh, invested in Dubai 
uh, supporting over 450 projects in the cultural um, uh, sector, and that really has fueled the growth of creative properties like the Jamil Art Center, uh, Al Sarkal Avenue, the Dubai uh, Design District, Art Dubai, um, the Ishara Arts Foundation, and, and, and many others. So if I'm, I'm hoping, uh, and of course, um, the trailblazers and visionaries in this regard have been the, the Sharjah Art Foundation, which has now completed 30 years since its uh, inception and its 15th iteration, which concluded last year, um, and has grown significantly now to encompass over uh, um, 150 um, uh, artists representing over 70 uh, countries uh, across, uh, uh, across uh, the Global South and um, 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 has also organized an incredible array of programs uh, through the Biennale, you know, the Biennale, which includes performances, music, art, installations, across a very, very ambitious set of over 18 locations, uh, encompassing over five towns and districts of the Emirate of Sharjah. Uh, so I hope that sort of created a visual narrative in your minds of the kind of creative energy that's exploding across the region, and I haven't even touched upon Qatar yet. But with that, let me dive into my first question for both of you, uh, and which is really, if you could, with that context, give us a little bit of an overview of the ethos of the institutions that, uh, that both of you lead, and uh, how they've grown since then, the directions they've taken since then. I know they are very diverse and uh, unique, uh, but um, would be curious to know how they complement each other and the ecosystems that they uh, serve. Um, given that Sharjah has been a trailblazer, and I think it's in all fairness, I'd like Navar to start, please. And then, um, um, Sabi, if you'd like to then just share a little bit of what Don had to say about the Jamila Center and then give us your perspectives. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, and actually, hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. I think you've kind of summed um, not some, but I think you've given a good introduction to what um, what Charger Art Foundation is and, and what we do. Um, I think maybe to give a little bit of context as to how we came about and, and who we are exactly, um, the Charger Art Foundation is a public entity, so we're a government-run foundation. And we have a very interesting model in which we emerged outside of a biennial. So even before we were a foundation, there was a biennial in Charger in the 90s. And it was actually artist initiated. Um, it came out of um, a group of artists putting together a show who were then publicly fundraising. And then the government noticed that they were public fundraising and said, you know, we don't want you to ask for money for culture. We will give it to you. We will support you. And then they initiated the Fine Arts Society. With it came the first biennial. And we only came about um, in 2009 after a series of biennials had, had taken place. And in the early days, the biennials were very um, local and sometimes regional and focused mostly on kind of, um, I would say, like the Arab world mostly, and took a very um, traditional approach of country representation. And then when our president and director, Hur al-Qasimi, came back from her um, studies at the, at the Royal College of Arts, <laughs> she had seen Okui's documenta and it had changed her life and, and, and she said, you know, we need this in Sharjah. Sound effects accompanying the sound. Yeah. <laughs> so came back to Sharjah and said, listen, we need to change the format of the biennial. She came back from art school, um, worked with the team and said it cannot be country representation. Nobody's from one place anymore. It has to be thematic. It has to be about, it has to be curated. Um, and it was a very mold, uh, old model at the time, and so everybody quit, and they said, do it yourself. The team um, that was kind of, of a, you know, an older generation of kind of older men in the government stepped down, um, and she called on artists, friends, and curators, and they opened a fantastic biennial at the time, um, and it put the biennial on the map because nothing like it, no, nobody had seen anything like it. Um, and this was um, in 2006, 
Um, yes. So we've grown from then, um, and today, because because of the because the biennial came and went every two years, the biennial was also commissioning. Um, there was conferences, there were grants that were coming out of it. So Sharjah felt like there needed to be something more permanent. A biennial couldn't come and go, and the community would have nothing in between. So the foundation was formed in 2009 as really as um, a catalyst for all of this, as something that is rooted. And then what happened was that from biennial to biennial, there were programs year-round, there were grants year-round, there were opportunities for artists and for the community. So we went from um, a project that happened once every two years to really a full-blown foundation. So now a year-round foundation, and we do about um, 13 to 15 exhibitions a year, conferences, um, grants. Uh, we commission work. We collect. We have a large growing collection. Um, education programs, and we work with film, music, and performance as well. So we've come a long way, I think. And how large is your team? Uh, We're almost at 300 now. Wow. Yes, and we work across 15 um, office spaces. So we're quite spread out. In the presentation, you might, in one of the images, you'll see a map that shows where we're located. So we're really across. Um, I think people don't always um, imagine how vast Sharjah is, but we're on both coasts. So we really work across uh, the entire Emirates and cover a lot of geographic location. Thank you. Thank you, Navar. That was great. Um, Sabi? You want to mention about the trina, uh, the architecture triennale, given it's not even just art? Maybe later? Yeah. No? Maybe later? OK. Um, well, first of all, a very big thank you to everyone at MGW who's invited us and who's organized this. It's fantastic to be among so many friends. And also in a conversation like this, it's almost like coming here to give an update, a field report, <laughs> given I've been in conversation with most of you for so long. So this is going to be a little bit like a field report, but I'm, I'm with some fantastic panelists with whom I think it's going to be more than just a field report. Um, as Inakshi said, um, I'm going to read a note from Don, who is going to be here speaking on behalf of Jamil Arts Center. And I'll, I'll read as I go. Um, so Don says, no, I think it's fine. Um, Good morning, everyone. I was looking forward to the talk and the opportunity to engage in discussions with my esteemed colleagues, Nawar and Sabi, uh, and moderator Inakshi. Even though I can't be there in person, I would like to give a brief overview of Art Jamil, who we are, and what we do. Art Jamil supports artists and creative communities. Founded and supported by the Jamil Family Philanthropies, the independent organization works globally with its international base in the UAE. Art Jamil's programs are grounded in a dynamic understanding of the arts as fundamental to life and accessible to all. Art Jamil comprises two institutions, Jamil Art Center in Dubai, UAE, and Hey Jamil in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Hey, by the way, means neighborhood. So Hey Jamil is basically drawing on this idea that we want to be a neighborhood center, which draws in a lot of the local community, youth as well. Art Jamil embraces a collaborative model, partnering with institutions and encourages collaborations locally and internationally. Prioritizing arts and education, which sit as two distinct entities across both institutions, the programming encompasses a diverse range. This includes thoughtfully curated exhibitions, centering around artists and pertinent themes in the region, festivals and symposiums dedicated to promoting the art and current issues, and youth programming that nurtures upcoming UAE creative talent. The organization houses a dedicated collection and library, forming the backbone of the organization. The collection is committed to organize original research and thinking with key initiatives such as radical collecting and exploring new approaches to collection care and management relevant to institutional art collections situated in South and West Asia. The two institutions present subtle distinctions. Jamil Art Center is located in Dubai's Jaddaf waterfront, is a contemporary art institution showcasing contemporary art and engages uh, communities through exhibitions, learning, programs, and research. 
Hey Jamil, located in Jeddah, is a creative hub and it's intent on bringing together a wide range of creative disciplines in one destination, including a contemporary art gallery, educational, uh, education programs, residency and studio spaces, independent cinema, and performance space. Both institutions collaborate with and support artists from South and West Asia and beyond, encouraging broad audience engagement with the artworks, programs, and ideas generated. By developing these ecosystems, we contribute to building a sustainable, future-oriented art scene and creative communities both in the UAE, KSA, and across our global network. Before I conclude, I would like to thank everyone who's been involved in organizing Mumbai Gallery Weekend in this talk. I hope the discussions today are insightful and inspiring. So that was Dawn's note, and I should add, given she's not here, that um, our Jamil's been directed by Antonia Carver, who is the director of Art Dubai for many years. And she's been a phenomenal figure who brought together really uh, a lot of the arts from around the Arab region. So with her vision, I think there's been a, a lot of influx of artists, thinkers, who um, have been trying to build a discourse around the UAE. So since uh, Antonia Carver was the director of Art Dubai, she had instituted what is now practically an institution of its own called the Global Art Forum. So this has been something directed by Shimon Basar, and he's been leading a, a very strong program around discourses of the future or futurity. So any global, any Art Dubai that you might visit, you will always find a talks program that's primarily dedicated to the Global Art Forum. And it's really asking questions around future technology. A lot of times it's dystopic as well and reveling in dystopia, so that's Shimon's thing. But besides that, of course, there's a lot of constructive discussion around speculative realism, around uh, a, a lot of uh, work on architecture and city discourses. And much of that continues to carry over into our Jamil. So if you ever happen to visit Dubai and you see our Jamil, what you will find is a, a strong uh, set of programs that are not only art oriented, but also architecture oriented. And uh, a famous art his, uh, architecture historian, Todd Reese, has been uh, doing a lot of work at uh, Jamil Art Center. So they keep having curatorial programs around architecture as well. And that's something that I think, again, Sharjah Art Foundation has paved the way because of their Sharjah Char Char Architecture Triennale and the work around heritage that they keep, uh, I think, reviving. Um, that being said, the Jamil Art Center is operating more like a, like a Kunsthal model. It's a contemporary art museum of sorts, a lot more program oriented. So it's not, it's sometimes looking at mid 20th century, but that's usually as far as it goes. It's not looking at Arab modernism and these kinds of discourses as much, which is something that actually uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation and other museums, the Barjil Art Foundation in the UAE uh, focus on. And there is a lot of work that's been done on Arab modernism again supported by Sharjah Art Foundation, but also Barjil Art Foundation and their patron, uh, Sultan Saud Al Qasimi. And um, are you guys related? Cousins. Sultan? Cousins, okay. Cousins in the bigger scheme of okay. Arab okay, so cousins. Uh, but also uh, a very enlightened person, an art, uh, architecture historian himself, has set up chairs of architecture studies and Arab studies at Yale and universities uh, in the West and is building a, a, a young community of researchers and scholars who would study all of this. Besides their collection building at Barjil, they also uh, loan a lot of works to museums all over the world. So a lot of Arab art, therefore, is being supported because of collection loans in major museums around the world. And this is, of course, Arab modernism. So there's Barjil, there's Sharjah Art Foundation, there's Jamil Art Center operating like a Kunsthal model. And there's a resurgence of, well, uh, nonprofits, but I'll come to that. This was just to give you a lay of the land, which we'll, I'm sure, touch on in more detail. Which brings me to Ishara, uh, which is a nonprofit organization, and I think quite a few of you have uh, visited us or have been in touch with us because we've just been doing work together. Um, I think at Ishara, um, being a nonprofit, it was founded by Smita Prabhakar, a businesswoman who's been based in the UAE for the past 40 years. So for her, that is home. She grew up in India, her and her husband. And when they moved there, they settled there, that being their home. I think the, the stories of 
uh, having two homes, or what does a home even mean, has been very central to, to Smitha's life and story. And so when she set up Ishara, she'd already been collecting uh, modern and mostly contemporary art from India for already 20 years. So post a 20 year journey of art collecting, she set up uh, Ishara, and at Ishara, the idea was to not just represent contemporary Indian art, but also contemporary South Asian art, given that in the UAE, there's such a convergence of all of these nationalities from, uh, well, the global South at large, but South Asia to a large extent. And um, at the foundation, we primarily work via exhibitions, programs, collaborations, uh, and collection building. Um, the idea of presenting South Asian contemporary art is not just trying to show what's going on back home kind of thing. Let's just show what's happening uh, in South Asia and try and bring artists from there over. But rather, how do we collaborate or, or contribute to a rethinking of South Asia? And the idea of this at least comes from my own experience having worked for 10 years at AAA, where one of the key themes or focuses was complex geographies. So how do we complicate the idea of South Asia? And this comes fundamentally with one idea, which is that South Asia is booming uh, with jets. Is that South Asia means different things in different places. So what South Asia means sitting here in India might mean very differently from what South Asia means if you're sitting in Sri Lanka might mean something very different if you're sitting in London, and will mean something very different if you're sitting in New York and Australia. So the contours, as well as the kind of tropes that define South Asia, change from place to place. It's not one thing that is geographical, but rather it is an entity that is historical. And therefore, it keeps getting redefined from time to time and from place to place. So at Ishara, we try to explore these questions via the exhibitions we do. And, um, and I think I'll speak more about um, the foundation and its vision later, but we're a very small team. And I'll just make the last point, which is that given how small we are, so we're aware of our scale. Uh, we might appear very big, uh, but we're actually very tiny. And so given an awareness of our size compared so how to- How tiny is tiny? Um, so we're a group of six staff members, okay. which includes myself. Okay. Uh, we have a little bit of the support from Smitha's company. And um, so our HR and our accounting and all kind of get handled by them. But primarily all the Ishara Foundation work happens by a team of five to six people. And in that, we, we do what we can. And um, why I'm bringing up the question of scale is because that's the awareness we bring in how much and what we want to contribute. So our contributions, therefore, are very specific, very precise to the discourses of regional representation, both in West Asia, as well as what it's doing to South Asia as well. Yeah. well thank you for that. I mean, I think um, all three very, very distinct models and very interesting models. Um, um, you know, moving on a little bit and add, just sort of building on this discussion, the Middle East uh, does enjoy a vantage point in terms of location. It is a de facto melting pot for all things South Asia equally uh, West Asia, parts of Southeast Asia, and um, increasingly North Africa as well. Um, I'm curious as to how each of you uh, perceive this um, emergence of regional ecosystems and regional affinities, and uh, how this geographic confluence has uh, shaped the growth of contemporary institutions like yours uh, in the region. Um, maybe Navar, would you like to? Well, I think it's important um, to note also kind of like where we are geographically. Sharjah, for example, is a port city. So historically, we've been a place of we've been a place where people have come and come and go from, and people have settled. And our programming, and and when we look at our programming and what we want to do, we always look at the communities around us, and that's. The ethos uh, that ethos is what what we want to reflect in our programs. We need to speak to everybody. We need to speak to matters that relate to everybody, and look at the larger picture of not just people in charge or the UAE, but the region around us. Our collection, for example, um, many years ago we made a decision that our collection is south, south, east, east, and that's all we're going to collect 
and or primarily the mo most of what we're going to collect. So we're looking at our region and beyond. We're looking inwards, not outwards, if that makes sense. Um, and I think it's because of, af you know, also looking at um, after working in an institution for so many years and looking at the impact that our institutions like us have on our region, it makes sense thinking about the future that we need to be collecting from here. And it's, you know, what are we going to leave what are, what are we going to leave behind for the communities of Sharjah or for our region in the future? So um, our programming, our exhibitions, um, kind of our visions curatorially and uh, our collection strategy really looks at where we are um, and who's around us. And we've seen also um, similar kind of thought in, in, in other, like in institutions around us as well. So for example, in Sharjah, there's the Africa Institute, which is a sister organization, but it's, we work very closely with them. And they're um, an academic institution focused on African and post-African studies, and the only one in the region. So they're doing um, postgraduate studies um, and degrees. They also do language courses and conferences, and they also um, show exhibitions together. So there is this influence of other institutions like in Sharjah that are also looking at kind of um, the global south, Africa, and beyond. Um, and in, in having these institutions, I'm, I mean, I'm speaking about Sharjah specifically, but also between us, Ishara, other people in the UAE, I think that it makes the conversation so much more dynamic and when people come to the UAE or people who are coming really from regions that are not ours I think they don't know what to expect and then they realize oh wait but you're showing African art and you're showing South Asian art and you're showing uh, Southeast Asian art and it's not just you know it's it's so much more than I think what people think to, to expect but it really is a reflection of where we are geographically on the map um, at the very essence. No thank you for that uh, Navar and um Sabi, uh, same question, you know, sort of addressed to you, but also an adjacent question on um, if you can add to that and, and also give us some perspectives on South Asian art and how you've seen it evolve, uh, the artists, the contemporary explorations that you're seeing. Um, um, so a bit of both, yeah. Um, so the context of the Middle East first, um, if any of you have been or haven't been, you probably know someone either from family or friends who, who have lived there or worked there. So at least in most cases, UAE feels almost like an extension of Kerala. Uh, anyone landing in either Abu Dhabi airport or Dubai airport will just see so many people from India, if not from various parts of Pakistan and Bangladesh, and everyone at the airport from and then outside the airport, the moment you take a taxi, basically people are speaking either to you in Malayalam or in Urdu or in Hindi or in Bangla. And so it almost feels like the strange extension in, in ways. And it's also reverse. It's almost like Gurgaon's ultimate dream when you reach Dubai or something. This is what Gurgaon would have imagined and loved to be, or Noida would have loved to be, right? So Sorry? In Gurgaon. That's right. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, but Gurgaon would have loved to have a sea <laughs> and a beach. So, it, there is all of this kind of, um, how do I say, it? like aspirational geography that we have to look at. It's not just a geography of it, what it is on, on the basis of its own history, but on the histories of migration. So, when I was uh, at least moving to the UAE to join Ashara in 2020, I was already aware of a few things because I'd, number one, grown up in Saudi, but also had visited Dubai on a number of occasions. Number one, it's a place that is thriving with universities. It has so many universities. And so for me, that was quite exciting because I'd already been connected to various ed university programs in India. And when you have a city or a country which has lots of universities, you know you have a dedicated group of people who are curious and engaged with the world for at least the next three years in a batch. And then they're going to change, and then there's going to be another batch. So that was one kind of contextual marker that was interesting for me. The other one, of course, is the awareness that it is a place of very dense supply chains. So it's supply chains of goods, but supply chains of people and bodies and money and oil, but also dreams and nightmares. So it's, it's a place that is not 
as a lot of people, when they go to Dubai, they usually use this metaphor of the bubble. But actually, that's not an accurate uh, description. It is not a, not a kind of bubble in and of itself. It, in fact, it's a very dense system of tunnels, all kinds of tunnels passing through, literally and metaphorically. And so uh, in the UAE, you see this, these kind of tunnel systems at work of people moving through and things moving through, institutions moving through. Suddenly, you're seeing a resurgence of all kinds of new museums being built. Are they going to be there forever? We don't know. So maybe the institutions are just passing through. It might just feel like that, right? So this actually produces a condition what uh, Deepak Kunni Krishnan and, and even scholars before him have written about. Deepak has written this fantastic book, and I can't recommend it enough, called Temporary People. It's full of just extraordinary stories of what does life mean in a state of temporariness, but temporariness not as a state of exception, but as a permanent condition. And that's, I think, what one needs to understand about the world right now, which is that my that migration is a contemporary condition. It is not an exception to the norm. Either people are migrating from cities to other cities, or countries to other countries, or continents to other continents. So how does one think of history from that kind of a location? And I think what a lot of organizations, including Ishara, are usually engaged with are questions such as this. What does a place mean? What does placemaking mean with so much transition, transitoriness, and passing through of uh, ideas of knowledge, of histories, all of that. And so it of obviously, therefore, offers a very different potential to look at history, not based on necessarily nationalisms, but what many art historians refer to as transnationalisms or multiple transnationalisms, uh, not even what Shiv Kumar would have called, art historian Shiv Kumar would have called contextual modernism, but much more complex configurations. And then the last point I'd make in terms of the context of the Middle East is. Just so you have an idea of how it's like organized between the different emirates, is that Abu Dhabi, being the capital, has become also in these past years the museum capital. So the Louvre is situated there. The Guggenheim Abu Dhabi that was going to get built is going to be there. Uh, uh, the NYU, New York University uh, campus is situated there. So it's really considering itself as an institutional hub and a museum hub of, of, uh, among the, all the emirates. And so the collections that they're developing is looking at, well, global or universal histories and trying to collect artists, both of a modern as well as uh, uh, contemporary era. Uh, Dubai, on the other hand, has been and remains more of a commercial center. And therefore, most of the commercial galleries are located in Dubai. So Al Sarkal is actually, Al Sarkal and Jamil are more like an exception to the norm in Dubai at least, because uh, even where Ishara is located in Al Sarkal Avenue is a place where um, there are lots of commercial galleries, which have been around for 10, 15 years. Um, and Al Sarkal Avenue itself is 15 years old. A lot of people are turning mid-teens this time around. Experimenters turning 15, except for Kemal that has turned 60. It's like the, 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 the grand uncle not. Yeah. Art Fair. India Art Fair yeah. is turning 15. Um, and then finally, Sharjah, at least, um, um, is, is, is a place where I think a lot of acad academia, because of the Africa Institute, as well as um, heritage, conservation, and revival, and of course, a very contemporary discourse of, uh, of around contemporary art is uh, getting established. And I'll make just one last point, if I can, um, which is that if you go and you spend a little time there, one thing very interesting is that even between us three institutions of Ishara, Jamil, and Sharjah, you can see regional contours being drawn quite differently in interesting ways. So whereas uh, something that Sharjah Foundation does, I think incredibly in, at a world level, not just as a, at, a, at a West Asian level, is how it brings together narratives uh, and histories of not only the Middle East slash West Asia, but also Africa and South Asia. So if you were to draw a kind of Venn diagram or circle, um, um, Sharjah Foundation reaches Africa, uh, West Asia, and South Asia, and focuses on those histories and those dialogues. Jamil Art Center, on the other hand, focuses quite, on, quite a lot on the Arab world and South Asia, as well as East Asia. So they bring a lot of artists from Southeast Asia, which is a large population that also resides there. So that circle kind of shifts a little bit to the right. 
And then Ishara, of course, being much smaller, is primarily focused on South Asia and South Asian diaspora. So it's like a circle, but with lots of lines drawn out. So that's, that's how I think the regional contours get drawn. And then it creates very interesting Just about relations. Just five minutes to go before that okay. stops. So therefore, it, it creates very different and interesting relations and dialogues between how any of these regions and their histories are being written about and talked about, even within this one place of the UAE, you know, because of these Venn diagrams that actually shift uh, in the focuses of different places. And we're not even touching on Saudi right now. So I, I love your metaphor of Dubai being a, you know, a cluster of tunnels and equally um, I don't know for all of you, but for me, I'm, I'm beginning to see so many different pieces coming together in the Middle East, the academic institutions, the museums, the, the, um, uh, you know, the work that, that Sharjah is doing. Um, it, it's, it's super exciting to see this whole picture emerge. Um, but um, Sabi, if, if, if we could just, um, and I, I mentioned it, but I'm going to repeat, but as an adjacent question, if you can share some perspectives, given that you look at this small little Venn diagram of South Asia, um, uh, some perspectives uh, on South Asian art and uh, how you've seen it evolve, um, the artists and the contemporary explorations that you've uh, been sort of seeing as a seeing from a distance. My God, this could be a symposium of its own. So I just exactly, speak from... You have exactly two minutes to answer. Okay, well, I'll just speak from Ishara then. At least what we try to do when we're looking at contemporary art from South Asia is number one... Well, actually, we have a three-step kind of process in the kind of exhibitions we do. One, doing solos. And in those solos, we've had a chance to work with Jitish, who's here. We've had a chance to work with Navjot, who's also living. Navjot, who's living here. We've actually our first exhibition that opened was with Zarina, who is in fact one of the artists that Smitha has most uh, extensively collected and relates to a lot because Zarina herself was diasporic, had lived in many cities, called many places her home. But more importantly, um, question: What does a home even mean? So. Um, we focus on solos. The Zarina exhibition was, in fact, uh, with uh, a, a duo exhibition that was curated by Nada Raza with Shilpa Gupta, who's also here. And so it looked at different generations. So a lot of the way we present uh, solos, even, or, or duo shows, are looking at relations, relations of geographies, relations of generations. And I think that's something that, at least at Ashara, we're quite aware, aware of. So when we invited Sohrab Hura to curate an exhibition. He was also looking at not what he thinks are the most relevant photographers or artists, but rather what are his field of relationships and practice? What, what is the field of practice that he inhabits? And so I think there's a lot of awareness of field making uh, as opposed to an art world, which is some abstract kind of uh, notion, the fields that people inhabit. So I think that's something that we focus on and we find more and more happening in relation to collectivization. Because, and that's, that's my actual answer to your question, which is that um, one is seeing a shift towards more and more collective energies. And it's not the first time in history that's happening. Koj and so many other initiatives, Sarai, Camp, have all, all of these places have been uh, places of confluence. Like, not necessarily, back in the day, Koj used to be called an alternative art space or something. I think one's not thinking of alternatives in the same way anymore, but rather field makings that, that exist and coexist with others to, to kind of either have counter narratives or, or complicate narratives, those kind of things. So I feel that's really something that's exciting me a lot about South Asian contemporary art, this collectivization, field making. And, and lastly, I think uh, art has always exceeded institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a strange narrative as if everyone is aspiring to be institutionalized. It's actually the other way around. I mean, uh, institutions have always tried to capture practices. So practices exceed institutions, have always exceeded institutions. The desire for being institutionalized, I still don't understand. Um, but um, I think one is seeing that uh, awareness already, that in institution or no institution, there are energies that are, that are coming together and doing things a lot right now. Thank you for that. And uh, Navar, moving on to you, um, uh, the Sharjah Biennale 15, which was uh, thinking historically in the present, ran until uh, June 2023. And um, in translating the late Nigerian curator um, Okwi 
Envisor's vision, it offered a critical reframing of post-colonial perspectives um, through some very significant commissions that you had uh, um, you know, organized. Uh, many in the audience here may not have had a chance to see it, so I'm wondering if you could share a few key highlights from it. And uh, in that vein, also share a few thoughts on African art, artists, and contemporary explorations in that part of the world. Yeah. So um, the, the last um, biennial was kind of, it was the largest edition we've had yet. Uh, we celebrated 30 years. And it was very much full circle for us because it was what initially led um, Hood, our president and director, to start the foundation. And it was, you know, we were always thinking wouldn't be amazing if we invited Okwi to curate. And when she did invite him, um, unfortunately, um, he had been quite ill at the time and during the process at one point said to her, I'm not going to be able to do it, you need to continue. And these are in my notes and this is what I want to do. And he had actually laid the framework for the beginning of um, the project. And it had been 30 commissions to commemorate 30 years of Sharjah Biennial. Um, but then as we worked, um, with, and then we, we put together obviously a group of, of collaborators and people that were close to Okui as an advisory committee. And as we were working, we realized, well, it is changing now. It is a different curator. But we took the 30 commissions into a starting point. It ended up being 70 commissions um, and 300 works. Uh, in total, 150 artists and collectives. Um, but the works were monumental. They were the biggest commissions I think we've ever done. Uh, some of the most, I think, well-received well um, works were uh, uprooted by Doris Salcedo, which a lot of people may have seen. Um, uh, Hajj Rahid's project as well. Some images you, you might see on the presentation. Uh, Yinka Shonibare had some major new commissions. And for this edition, I think it was the, the biggest, um, not just the biggest in scale, but it was the largest in terms of the numbers of partnerships that we had secured and co-commissioners we had secured. And for the longest time, um, for us working in, you know, where we are in the Middle East, working with international institutions, there was always this idea of, well, why should we support you? You have government funding. Why should we, you know? But, it, but getting um, artists' work supported for us is always not just about getting the funding, but also giving the artists, um, giving the projects a chance to be seen in different places around the world. Um, the projects traveled. Some of the projects that we commissioned had premiered in other places. Um, and, and then has come to Sharjah and gone somewhere else. So it really is about mobilizing these projects more than it is about just getting the show done. Um, and obviously with the last edition of the Biennial, there was a large um, number of works by African artists or artists from the diaspora. And it was really, uh, I think for, for many of us and for a lot of people um, who visited, um, a way to think, not, not just to think about, but to contextualize all of, the, all of the thought processes that we were thinking about when it came to post-colonialism, restitution, repatriation. There was a lot of conversations that were being had in academia that for a lot of people, um, and really in the UAE, aside from the Africa Institute, there weren't a lot of those conversations happening. So for a lot of people having the project in person helped um, think about and contextualize these larger conversations that were happening in the academic realm, and I'm talking about people who come from a non-arts audience uh, or a non-academic audience. Um, and then of course with, um, with the presence of the Africa Institute, the fellows, uh, and all of the research, um, we have an opportunity to work with more artists from the African diaspora, and we do approximately one to two exhibitions a year with them, um, with artists from Africa. So next year, or this year, we're showing Henok Malkamzer, who's an Ethiopian painter. Um, we've commissioned works. We work with some of the curators and faculty at the Institute. So there's a lot of, so we have these different conversations with um, the people around us. And um, there has been, I think from the last two years, there's been a big focus on, on African art, I think, in Sharjah. Um, okay, if we had to move on a little bit from here, um, one of the things we focused on quite Can you all, oh, okay. One of the things we focus on very intensely at um, Asia Society, and we're, we're quite anal about it, is community engagement, right? 
Um, I'd love to get a deeper understanding of um, who your communities are uh, in the context of your physical locations and your overarching missions and um, how do you drive this engagement and what are the changes that you're seeing in this regard in the, in the, in the UAE? Um, for us, I mean, community engagement is first and foremost the people around us, and um, you know, we work in in our our, our headquarters are in um, the old heart of Sharjah by the old souk, so it's not your art audience really. Um, and uh, we've done amazing projects. I mean, we've done something amazing with we've done a number of amazing projects with Camp in in. Um, in one of the heritage houses and also in the souk and there was a project that really actually worked with the sailors who are across the street from us and there was a commission the film from gulf to gulf to gulf which is brilliant and one of uh, the most beautiful projects i think we've we've done and we've worked on that project and then we've screened it many years later in the kind of in the public sphere and um, in different exhibitions and seeing people you know, that is our audience. Peop no, our audience is not just the art audience, obviously, and people who come for the exhibitions, but also people who walk through, people who work across the street in the port, the shopkeepers in the souk. When they come to us and say, when's the biennial? Can you do something in my shop? That's when you know you're engaging with the community around you. So we try as much as we can, not to just kind of, I mean, of course, you know, we try to have exhibitions that speak to people in terms of the content. Um, and then, you know, we try to use different languages in our advertising and in our brochures. But also beyond that, um, we try to create spaces for people to come together. And, and are you finding a lot of local engagement now over the years? Yes. Yeah. Yes, more yeah, than, yeah. yes, I yeah, think yeah. more than ever. Yeah. And primarily, aside from, aside from the exhibitions and the content of the shows, having public spaces means that people come with their families, people come with their kids, people have a space to hang out, and then they naturally enter you know, your spaces and engage. Yeah. Um, and because, we've, because we now have spaces across the Emirate of Sharjah and something that we do that is not very typical of, of maybe um, contemporary art institutions is that we repurpose and reuse a lot of buildings. So we play on nostalgia a little bit. Um, people, buildings from the 70s that people grew up remembering become art spaces, cafes. Um, when we work in different towns uh, and, and, and set up, whether it's studios or community spaces or a cafe or a shop, we also work with the town planning department to make sure that the area is green, that there's a public playground next door. So we work across um, different um, really key players in the, in the in the government or in, in the municipality to make sure that there is something for everybody. And then, of course, having um, exhibitions be free of charge. Almost everything we do is free and open to the public. Really brings in people. People don't expect it, um, as opposed to many other places where everything is paid. So um, having that and then having spaces like, you know, our community garden or public art projects um, that bring in really people from all walks of life really yeah. helps us grow um, what and, our and, and so it is. must be I mean, slowly and steadily so transformational to be able to you know sort of see this on a regular cadence and be yeah. a part of it uh, what about you Sabi I think the the question of community for us uh, given our scale we think of it like concentric circles and I think the the innermost circle is artists themselves but this is not just artists living in the UAE but artists all over artists I mean I think we're part of and constantly engaged with a community of artists living in India, Pakistan, Lahore, Sri Lanka, UK, and also artists living in uh, West, various parts of West Asia who are constantly passing through. So starting with that like tiny circle in the center, then it keeps expanding into academic communities, student communities. We do a lot with students from various universities and schools at the Shara. And then, of course, uh, one can't but not acknowledge a, a vast tourism community the number of people constantly passing through looking for what's interesting in this part of the world, whether they're coming on vacations or coming for work or coming to meet relatives. So we, we end up engaging a lot with those kinds of uh, people that are passing through. And of course, the, the, the wider community that happens to come through to Al Sarkal Avenue. So, um, so then the questions about community building, and I think that's just continuing conversations and just making people feel that 
Number one, art is not some elitist luxury commodity space, but rather a space for lots of rich conversations. So that's really how we look at community building. So it, it's a small team, but everyone has their own spiel on every exhibition we do, if each, and everyone gives their own tours of exhibitions. So everyone will have their own narratives. If you happen to meet my colleagues um, who are going to give you a tour, you'll get a different spiel of the show. So I think conversation becomes the, the main tool for holding together a space with lots of people who want to come back and then hear something further and talk something else. And I, and I saw that in action when I attended a moment in time. Was it a moment in time? It was beautifully curated, and I love the way you had voice notes for everything, and I love the way you juxtaposed the works as well. Um, uh, you were obviously uh, very fond of geometry when you were growing up, because I love your Venn diagrams and your concentric circles. But uh, you know, one of the aspects that most organizations in the arts struggle with, uh, especially in this part of the world, is um, uh, sustained financial flexibility. Um, and I know that that's not so much of an issue here in the sense that, uh, um, that the role of the sponsor or chief patron in your case does allow you to, to be a little more ambitious without necessarily thinking about this uh, on, an, on an everyday basis. Uh, but from my perspective, it's, it's really critical to have this in place if you really want to build institutions to scale and to stand the test of time. Um, so I'm just curious as to um, whether you have been exploring ways to diversify uh, funding sources through memberships, through public-private partnerships, uh, with a view to build, you know, these legacy institutions. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's um, we're we're publicly funded, and then we have a you know obviously patrons and supporters. Corporate sponsors and then international um, don uh, international supporters that come in to support projects. It changes every year. I think funding the question of funding is always tricky because, um, you know, with the government sometimes you have it and sometimes you don't. And there is unfortunately, you know, all around the world we're seeing less and less support um, for arts and culture. We're very lucky in Sharjah to have. Um, so much support, but I think sometimes it's tricky because when we do ask for support, a lot of people say, "Well, you're government funded. You know, why are you asking for support?" Or, you know, what do you mean? Like, you know, Sharjah gives you all this funding, and I think it's a lot. A lot of times for us, there's these cultural um, cultural connotations. People are very readily to support charity, but then they hesitate when it comes to art, and we've tried to tackle that by changing the approach from support art to support your local community organization where your kids are going to come and play and this is where they grow up and this is where they have access to things and it's really been about changing the mindset um, and then you know long-term planning obviously is um, tricky with obviously so much instability in the region and it's something that we're always thinking about, you know, how long are we gonna have this funding? How long are we gonna be able to do what we're doing? Um, but we have, I mean, because we're government funded, we're, our um, decree allows us to invest in specific things. So we're looking at, for example, you know, do we set up a parking lot to get money out of it? Do we invest in a, in a building? Do we rent something out? Um, and we do, obviously, you know, we've had everything from weddings to photo shoots to private parties at the foundation. Um, but then for long-term um, long term planning, we are always thinking about, you know, how do we, what are the long-term investments that we can make in order to have some kind of sustainable long-term um, income that is not, you know, our Dependent annual fundraising and right. annual donorships. Right. And right. it's a, you know, I think it's a challenge for, for everybody, but it's, um, our model allows us to think about, um, things that are more like investment based. And I mean, given that you right now have this, this, this support, it's a, it's a good time to think a little bit about it uh, for the future when, when some of these might become a little more challenging. Uh, Sabi? So um, with the Shana being a single patron uh, art space, thank you. Um, I think this, like, quite similar to what Nawar said, well, you've got a patron, why do you need funding, is a question that anyone would ask, even for a small space like Ishara, being funded by someone. So what we do end up, therefore, 
uh, relying on is, of course, we have a source source of the funding, but we therefore seek out collaborations, partnerships. We've been very generously um, rece we've been very generously receiving support from sometimes galleries. Um, helping in logistical support for exhibitions that we do. That's been one source. Um, the curious thing about the UAE is that there are no tax waivers if anyone's starting something like a charitable trust or charitable organization. So there's no incentive for someone to start something educational, something philanthropic. And that, I think, is something that Smitha was very mindful and aware of, that let's, let's do something and let's see if it might just set a precedent for more people wanting to contribute to the arts. Um, more collectors contributing to the arts. There's also practically no government funding, uh, at least coming to a, any kind of private space. Um, in fact, a lot of nonprofits, spaces that seem nonprofit and dedicated to the arts, usually register as commercial spaces um, because it's easier to register as a commercial space in the UAE, and also it's re easier to receive money from elsewhere if, for instance, uh, someone is partnering with you. We, on the other hand, decided to take the tougher route and we did decide to register as a nonprofit uh, to put our money where our mouth is. And because of that, it becomes even more difficult to even receive money. Um, so whoever does support us and does collaborate or partner with us, they end up, well, giving money directly to the vendors for whom the money would have been used, which is fine. I mean, we would have done the same thing if, if it was routed through us. So it's not easy securing funding. Uh, and so a lot of spaces actually depend on um, uh, collaborations and partnerships. And that's more or less um, the approach we've taken. We are looking more and more at um, uh, partnerships with, uh, with entities that, that have shared interests and um, looking at also uh, perhaps traveling exhibitions which can enable kind of uh, uh, more stakeholders to come in. So that's, that's how we navigate this. Okay. Uh, if with, with I'm, I'm, I'm also just thinking here about the fact that with all that's taking place in the Middle East at this point in time, um, are there still institutional voids that exist? I mean, one of the things you just spoke about, about not getting a tax break for setting up a foundation, to my mind, that's something that should be um, you know, thought about from a policy perspective. But uh, we started this discussion with the background of um, uh, the, how tourism can leverage art and culture. Um, and when I think of India and I think of people visiting, there's such a variety of, um, of uh, things for people to do, from visiting archaeological sites to festivals to, uh, you know, to a variety of cuisine. Um, how do you see this in the context of the Middle East? Uh, is a deeper cultural identity beyond contemporary art emerging in the region? I, I, I do think that we've overrun time a little bit, so may I request us if we can just answer this quickly and then we can throw the conversation open for questions from the audience. I mean, definitely there is um, more and more. I think it's maybe more tourism driven, but people are now kind of looking at not, not just now, but recently people have been looking at, you know, um, in Sharjah specifically, for example, you know, it's the hidden gem. So you go to the desert, you go to archaeological sites, you can also see art, but there's all these things that are, you know, it, they've always been there, but people haven't really maybe known about them. So sometimes we um, use that to our advantage. So we use um, we put exhibitions up in, in archaeological sites or in, not necessarily, but like in historic sites. We link um, our projects with archaeology curators, go to all of these different spaces, and then it becomes part of a bigger conversation of, you know, you're coming to Sharjah, you're going to see a project, but it's in the desert, and it's in this archaeological site, and then, you know, you're going to spend two more days and probably go and see that. So there is kind of, you know, there is a lot... Um, there is a lot more going on, um, but I think also going back to institutional voids and something I want to touch upon, which I think is, um, and kind of what Sabi said earlier about, um, you know, the, the government support and, and how that comes through. Um, I think like in many other places, there are so many challenges and the UAE is, you know, there's a thriving art scene. There's a thriving, it's a thriving business hub. It's, Tourism is thriving, but then there are sometimes these little things that um, are kind of forgotten because everybody's focused on like the business and the tourism. Um, so, for example, working in the arts, um, 
to set up an organization is difficult. To set up studios or licenses is difficult. A lot of times people have to um, rent out a private space and then, or open a business license to have a studio. There is no kind of artist license or ability to open your own studio. So you end up having to go to the commercial route, put a lot of money into it. So there are all of these little things that like we as institutions can see and are trying to tackle by opening studio spaces, by creating workspaces for artists, et cetera. Um, but I think we're still, there's still a lot to do in terms of like the infrastructure and the legislation. Yeah, but we're working like on it. Would you like to add to that? I yeah. would. Uh, I would add to what Nawar is saying. I think one thing that really stands out when you go to the UAE is that um, um, there's very little infrastructure for artists, mm -hmm. and it's not because um, there are no properties or spaces. It's just properties are so expensive. So therefore, a lot of pe less artists and thinkers and curators are attracted to move to this place, even though there's a lot of accessibility in terms of distance and cheap tickets and things, because your studio is going to be so expensive. So a lot of people have moved to so many cities in the world because, well, they can get a cheaper studio. Visas are not as difficult. And when you have a place which has many institutions and museums and foundations and galleries, but very few artists, um, that really creates a strange kind of distortion because finally the scene is made by artists to a huge, huge extent and the kind of conversations and, and surge of ideas that they bring to a city. So I think that's one kind of uh, thing. And the other, I think, is not so much um, a void but rather a problem, which is the tourism itself. Because the way tourism seems to have thrived in this place is based on bringing together a lot of consultants who then create all kinds of cliches and those cliches then become the norm and everyone just wants to identify the place with those cliches. Num like cliche number one, this place is a desert. It's not a desert. I mean, if you go to any part of West Asia, it's full of mountains, there are all kinds of amazing mangroves and all kinds of um, natural phenomena and ecosystems, but everything's just constantly portrayed as a desert and the Burj Khalifa. Something like that, right? So that's cliche number one. Cliche number two, um, there's no art here, so we need to bring artists from elsewhere. Um, there, are lots of, there, are lot, there's, there's lots of art, there's lots of young artists who are trying to sustain and, and do some really interesting things, but then you keep importing artists, and when you import artists, you dictate terms of having them make works that look like Western art, but actually, I mean, having spent these three, four years there, I've realized it's not even Western art, because when you go to the West, you see a lot more interesting stuff. It's actually more British American consultancy art. So it's the same artists actually doing some amazing works all around the world, but when, when they're commissioned to do something there, it looks like consultancy aesthetic. So that's really what you end up seeing there, consultancy aesthetic, which, is, which plays to the same cliche of tourism, a void. So actually, there's a lot of void clichéism going on all the time, which actually there's not. So I don't think it's the void that needs to be filled, but the mythological void that's being created that needs to be kind of just put aside. And so I think entering any of these spaces, passing through, the first question anyone would do is usually ask the most cliched questions. And I mean, if you go to some other place in the world, you don't ask because, those cliche because questions. That's the, but because that's the narrative. That's, that's the narrative, and everyone's reproducing yeah. it. Exactly. Are there any consultants in the audience here? <laughs> okay. So I'd like to throw this open uh, for questions from the audience. Um, uh, Jamal, would you like to start? Thank you very much. It was great. You made me want to come back there properly. <laughs> I think that was the idea. One goes to uh, Dubai Mall, and uh, there's really a mall of uh, a lot of great institutions there. And really, that was um, uh, the reason why um, it's also very inspirational to hear this today, because I think many of us in the audience, you know, are hankering for this here, and we have very, very little of it. So really, thank you for the perspective. It was wonderful, and actually, thank you for leading that. But, thank you, Shireen. Uh, I'm going to, I don't know if we have enough time, but Abhay to do the vote of thanks, please. Or if there are any other questions. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, how do your institutions navigate around obstacles like censorship, you know, in when it comes to the art space in your region, since it's uh, kind of governed by monarchies, I think all of the countries, as well as, you know, 
known as a religiously conservative region. So how do you navigate around censorship in art? Because art can get censored, right? I mean, it's censored in even our country. So I just want to know that. Thank you for the question. We were wondering when we would get the censorship question, actually. And it's an important one. And there's censorship everywhere and different kinds of censorship. Um, but I think the first, I think the first kind of the important thing is to be aware and not to say that, you know, to pretend that it doesn't exist and, you know, to say that, oh, we're, we're going to do all this stuff. And we're very aware of um, the do's and don'ts and the lines, um, the green lines, the yellow lines and the red lines. We try, we cross the yellow ones sometimes, but we know where the red ones lie. Um, but I think the UAE itself is very different. I wouldn't call it necessarily a religious space, but I think it is, um, there are spaces in the UAE that are um, maybe more uh, conservative, which is, you know, and then spaces that are not. Um, there is, I don't want to reference memes, but I'm sure you've seen all the memes of a woman in a niqab or a burqa and a woman in a bikini sitting next to each other on the beach. That is the reality of the UAE. There's, uh, you can, you know, there's all kinds of people, but there isn't this, um, with censorship, it's always, it always depends on what the bigger issues are. So for example, I would say 10 or 20 years ago, you couldn't touch religion, um, you couldn't touch um, queer issues. Now it's politics, um, you know, in 10 years it's gonna be something else. The lines are always changing and, and they're quite blurred. Uh, but I think the most important thing is for us to be aware of what we're doing and to do it, to navigate them, um, navigate the issues kind of with intention and to be smart about it. Because we do want, you know, we never want to censor artists. We want artists to speak and we all want the same thing. We work, we have more, I think, artistic freedom in what we do, um, specifically in Sharjah, because we are supported by the government. And when I say supported, I mean the, our, our patron and, and the ruler of Sharjah is a very educated man, an author and a playwright, and he gets it. So he encourages, to, he encourages us to push boundaries, but he says like, basically do them with kind of, you know, with intention and to be smart about it. Um, and we don't want to offend because if we, push, if we push a boundary that is borderline offensive and as a public institution and a and a, an organization that focuses on, on community, our commitment is also to our people. So we have to think about, is this gonna offend my community? Is this gonna be thought provoking? How do I find the balance? So it's about what we place, where we place it, and how we, how we do it. Um, and then also being honest and open to artists and saying, what is it that you're trying to say? This is going to get in trouble and get the whole thing shut down, but let's try it and do it in a different way. And you know, let's put this here and put this here and having that conversation. And it's been, um, I think it's been, I've seen that we're able to do so much more once we have those open conversations. And all agree that we're in a context where, you know, if it's very different, I think a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I've been having this conversation, I have this conversation, um, I've been having this conversation a lot recently where people think that, you know, people in the West think that you have to shout about issues. And in our part of the world, if we shout about an issue, we draw more attention to it. And then everybody gets in trouble. So rather than saying that we're all gonna speak about this issue or that issue and take it to the streets, we do it quietly, we do it very smartly. Um, and we focus on, for example, we do it through our art, through music, through writing, through publishing. And then you get people to come together and talk about things and work on you know mobilization and action and what we're going to do rather than do rather than shout about it which gets everybody and shut down and, and and censorship is not unique to the UAE oh, for sure, now for sure yeah. I mean, we, we have enough and more happening here <laughs> just one last question and may i request to make it very quick and then uh, i'm going to request up through the closing yeah. yeah hello could you hear me uh well i i don't have a question but i have an answer so uh, the answer is, I, I thought the UAE and Dubai was one big mall, and I was terrified of going there. And, and then I rubbished my prejudgment, and I said, no, let me go, let me discover. And that's what I did in 2021. And I want to gift all of you uh, what I did in 2021, Sabi. We met in the Dubai, and for you, and for you. 
So uh, for me, it was an absolute discovery. And I, I so agree with all of you in, in saying that we have to go beyond the art community. We have to reach a larger uh, community of people and, and engage with them, you know, lure them into the arts. And that's my uh, mission since 25 years I've been doing this. And Thank you. that's my mission is, is uh, to uh, find unity in diversity and Thank disseminate you. the idea. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, you know, uh, it all seems so nice when she handed the books that this seems like an odd remark. Um, thank you for this wonderful sketch that you sort of sketched out of a region, but also of a time frame. And I had these kind of free associative thoughts of other constellations that emerged or just pre-emerged uh, to these moments. I mean, I'm thinking of the Triangle Artist Network. Uh, between uh, Johannesburg, London, and, K and New York, that then became a quadrilateral, became Pentagon, Hexagon, and then became like this art artist constellation. But also this uh, sequence of hyphenations that happened between, let's say, Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific Triennial, West Asia, South Asia, um, South South, tropical lines. Um, and uh, there was a third thought that really the museum the Guggenheim Bilbao effect that became spoken of in the early 2000s has all a kind of slightly staggered predecessors to these moments when you see the total resurgence really happen in the UAE and the UK and the, sorry in the in the Middle East. But these were kind of free associative thoughts that came as you guys were speaking of the wider network. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jitish. Any any comments, Sabi? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so just continuing with the free associations while both of you were talking, um, Sabi, you know, step down out of the airport and you're greeted with a host of migrant South Asian languages. Um, Nawar saying how the community and the locals are quite important and locals there are migrant and migrant labor. Um, so just riffing off what you guys said, um, a red line that we couldn't cross in the UAE as a collective, as a community, as a community of artists was speaking about the labor. And uh, speaking of consultancy, we approached the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi long before it was built, of, across a table negotiating with the directors and the curators. There was a teacup the size of that Perrier bottle and the table that Nawar has. And they said, that's Guggenheim, New York, but that's Guggenheim, Abu Dhabi, speaking of scale, right? And then the Frank Gehry cones rising up into the sky. And all we told them was, if you're building these mega institutions, do it on fair labor. Please pay them well, and you know, all the things that come in the UAE and other Gulf states with migrant labor. This did not go down well. There's an artist boycott. There are a hundred or more very, very senior artists from the Minasa region who still hold on to the boycott of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. And this has also come at a cost because certain artists have been banned from there. So when we think of community, I just want to, to tell everyone that there has to be solidarity across these kind of things, right? And uh, Walid Raad is banned, a member of camp, Ashok is still banned in the UAE, but we also take solace in the other friendly institutions who continue to work with us, continue to push us, and even though people don't travel, the art travels. Comment? Hmm? I think that's implicit, Sharjah Art Foundation support. Um, against, despite all of this that happens. And just a little trivia, the Al Hisan Fort, which is in the heart of Sharjah, historians have told us it used to not point out at the sea. It was open to the sea. The cannons faced landward. Uh, just a small response to both Jipish and China. I think it's very important, and I'm, thank you for raising some of these predecessors that have actually been around uh, in leading up to where we are right now. 
And I think what's important possibly is to flag the different kinds of, I guess, geopolitical as well as economic uh, imperatives that were also changing along with those times. So the whole idea of multiculturalism and a certain kind of welfare state and, and various kinds of support coming from Europe towards um, Asia, whether it was HIVOS for Indonesia, whether it was Ford Foundation for India. So there was a moment when these kind of quadrilaterals and geometries were being drawn with certain kind of funding systems. And those funding bodies changing their own priorities, impacting these kinds of geometries as well. So I think it would be really worth studying how to map all of these out in time along with larger policies that have existed. Then to the question of um, uh, artist solidarities and how institutions and museums kind of respond to them, I think it's, um, uh, it's probably important to identify the fact that even within the UAE and even within West Asia, each of these countries and each of these, within UAE for instance, each of the Emirates takes very different political stances sometimes. So Sharjah Art Foundation for instance was the first one to uh, come out with a statement that was pro-Palestinian uh, for one. And so, and um, and a different emirate would not have done that immediately and has a slightly different take. So actually within the UAE also it's not some kind of a unified um, uh, approach to to larger questions of uh, political struggles and things, but rather there is some level of diversity and the institutions are reflecting those. And lastly, I think um, what we're seeing at the moment with uh, the various geopolitical shifts that are going on, which also reflect economically because oil is at the heart of so many of them. Russia's oil gets sanctioned from Europe. Lots of that oil is getting rerouted from the Middle East. A lot of Ukrainians having moved to the UAE, but also a lot of Russians to escape conscription are moving to the UAE. So you see all kinds of movements passing through. And you know, on maybe a closing note to what Shino was saying, I came across some uh, Russian friends who were number one escaping conscription, but also facing uh, or feeling the, the dread of uh, a, a kind of regime that is also cracking down on different uh, sexual orientations within the country um, and them finding solace moving to the UAE because they're not going to be troubled there. So actually the geopolitics of our time right now seems to be placing West Asia yet again at the heart of a lot of movement and trouble going on. And how we're going to read this is not going to be one narrative. It's going to be very different narratives that ge generally don't even speak to one another. So I, I think that's work to be done on our part as uh, art organizations as well as, as I think artists and thinkers. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's really well said, Sabi. And thank you for making us, we, we started talking about a cultural renaissance, but thank you for helping us end on that, that note of reflection because I think Growth is great, but we also need to do it in a humane and in a purposeful way. So thank you for that. Uh, Abhay, over to you. So just a quick uh, vote of thanks on behalf of all the galleries that make up uh, Mumbai Gallery Weekend, 35, I think 35 galleries. Just want to uh, say really thank you for that moderating that spirited conversation and to our esteemed panelists for uh, for, for you know, for leaving us with thoughts which are both uh, insightful as well as inspiring. I think we 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 we've all shared uh, very freely. Uh, you've you've given us a sense of the lay of the land from where you come from, the museums, and I think we all aspire to, in our own ways, what we are doing in our own small ways as galleries. The Mumbai Gallery Weekend also started in 2012, and we bind you know we 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 bind together and we try and do things which are probably outside the mandate of what typical commercial galleries would do. So I think it's a, it's a great uh, community and a great uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and arts. And, and uh, thank you so much again. And thank you for the museum for uh, hosting this and to, uh, to the India Art Fair team and to all of you who were there to make this happen. And uh, please join us after this for lunch uh, right across here at the garden. So thank you again. Thank you.